Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'd like to uh, first of all thank the uh, IANS committee for having me as a guest speaker at this 2014 annual IANS conference. All those in attendance and also those that are watching via the internet. Things have happened, you know, NDEs are, are very strange. First of all, to get here was a miracle in itself because I've had some serious uh, roadblocks put in my way every time that I go up and talk about an NDE. Uh, a month ago, I got an abscessed tooth. I mean, the pain was so bad that it was uh, incapacitating where I couldn't even drive my car. Uh, a week ago, my internet went down at the house, and it was down for, until an hour before I left to come here. And the technician said, we, do, we really don't know why it went down. We just rehooked the wires back up the way they were, and it came back on. We, we have no explanation for it. Every place I went to try to check my email wouldn't allow me to check my email. Uh, my car, I go to get in my car and a week ago, and the, and the key breaks off in the ignition. <laughs> and it's an all-wheel drive car, so you can't, when it breaks off in the ignition, you can't do anything. And you li literally have to get the car picked up and towed somewhere, because it, it won't move. And the, uh, we call them, the locksmiths won't come out. Because that's a dealer issue, that's not something we can handle. Uh, so four days without a car. Uh, the car started acting before I was going to come here, so I had to rent a vehicle. Uh, just, I mean, just on and on and on, things were happening to seriously keep me from addressing what I'm going to address today. I have some very important things I need to cover because I have a procedure that we've developed that uh, basically will end the uh, suicide issue. And it's, it's something, this is the first time publicly that it's been actually uh, announced. It's been used on hundreds of people already with 100% success rate. Uh, it's also a self-help uh, uh, procedure so that you can bypass the stigma associated with depression and uh, having suicidal thoughts. The book, when I wrote it in 2003, uh, worst publisher ever. <laughs> Somehow, uh, I get a call from, I mean, literally, I don't even know how the book even sold a book. Uh, ABC calls me and says, we want to put you on 2020. I said, okay, you know, no, no big deal. So they put me on talking about the, uh, the NDEs. And, it's, it, you know, going public about NDEs, that's distressing in itself because uh, they literally um, followed me for six months with private investigators, uh, ABC did. They videotaped me for seven hours, and then they only show like seven minutes on TV, and then people want to judge you on those seven minutes. It's like, really? You know, it's like, it was seven minutes out of seven hours, and you expect everything to get covered in there that they didn't put on there. So I get some pretty weird emails from people, and it's very distressing to be, have people call you a liar, and I mean, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, Usually it's religious people that have these false beliefs and they, they say, you know, you can't die and go to hell because that's in the Bible and all this stuff, whatever. I'm a very spiritual person. I believe in heaven and hell, but I don't believe in religion, organized religion. And um, I've been on coast to coast. I survived beyond and back. If anyone wants me to do this, I don't go seeking these things out. People come to me. They ask me if I want to talk about it. I say yes. I'll share the experience to help other people. I didn't get paid for anything from these things. I'm a, a seven million viewers watched the uh, 2020 on Good Morning America, and they didn't even mention my book. So, <laughs> so it's like I didn't sell anything from that. So to say I profiteered from this stuff is, is kind of ridiculous. And even the nonprofit I run, I don't get a paycheck from them. I have another job I do and a hobby that pays my expenses. So... Uh, for people, to, I want to make sure everyone knows that I don't make any money from this, and it's ridiculous to even think that. I, I'm coming out about some things, too, about how uh, the NDs have affected me, which I haven't really been forthcoming because of the, you know, I don't want to be a guinea pig, basically. I've already done some things with IANs where they do research and 
very extensive research. Uh, the Northern University of Texas did a very extensive uh, research program on people who've had uh, hell or uh, suicide NDEs, and it was, it was interesting to me. But I don't want to become a guinea pig. You know, it's I, I just want to share what happened. If you learn something from it, you know, great. If not, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I'm just sharing what happened. Uh, I had two near-death experiences, one where I went to heaven and one I went to hell. And 12 at the first one, 25 at the second one. Uh, I'm going to be talking very quickly because i got a lot of stuff to talk about. Hopefully you can catch up or watch it on the uh, reruns or something. Um, I, I, I wrote a, a suicide prevention guide booklet uh, last year that's been endorsed by uh, psychiatrists, uh, mental health experts, doctors, and uh, I don't know if you're aware of uh, neuro-linguistic programmers, the top ones in the world have endorsed this book also. And it has a procedure at the end of it also that removes uh, depression, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, uh, and I'll talk about that later too. That booklet is available online at our uh, ISP's website, International Suicide Prevention. And it's in, it's in eight languages now. It's going to be in nine here within the end of the month. Because we this is a world issue, not just a uh, U.S. issue. I, I have heavy computer knowledge. Uh, started out after the first NDE. Uh, just some gift that was given to me with electronics. I, I, at some people called me a computer whisperer where I could put my hand on a computer and I think, oh, this thing's got a virus. You know, it's kind of weird, but it freaks people out. I go to banks, they have a team of people working on the system, and I go in and fix it in an hour, and they're asking me what I did, and I said, I don't know what I did. I just fixed it, you know. And they said, well, how could that be? I go, I don't know, I just did. Excuse me, drop my glasses. And uh, so, and I, I go, I'm the hacker that nobody knows about. You know, I've never come clean about that. I just go in the system to look around. I don't steal anything. I just look at stuff and leave. And nobody knows I'm there. Nobody knows who I am. I don't have a name, nothing. Just do it. But I don't tell anybody because, like, again, I don't want to be a guinea pig. I don't want to be experimented on. I don't want to be tested. I just do it for fun. So um, I've been doing that for, since the 80s. And uh, just because it's something, I just know how to get into systems without nobody knowing I'm there. And I don't want anybody knowing I'm there. I'm not doing it to be uh, malicious in any way. I just do it because it's fun to do. But now I probably won't be able to do it because they're going to be watching my computer. So uh, volunteer. I, I go out and do post-suicide family support for our organization, which, uh, I mean, I go to... Funerals, I clean up suicide scenes, very unpleasant, by the way. And it's because people who have a suicide in the house, they don't have the money or insurance to have it done, they usually end up doing it, which makes them double jeopardy in their home because it's a double trauma and it's compounded. So they're like 75% more likely to kill themselves later on in life. So that's why I do it. Uh, grief uh, specialist, I go out and I know how to uh, diminish the grief within a few minutes, uh, another gift that I've gotten, 25 years of that work. Uh, psychology, um, in, in addition to traditional schooling, I've uh, been on 24-hour calls since 2006 on a suicide prevention hotline. You can't get any more into it than that because you got people on the edge of a building, they're calling you, you better know what you're doing. And, and basically, I have no training in that other than I tried to kill myself. And then it came to me a few years ago how to fix the problem. And I've been fixing it ever since then. And there's no repeats after I work with people. Um, been doing that for eight years plus. Interventions, I go out to uh, all weird places. I went to an Indian tribe up way up north in Canada on the East Coast and, 
and they were having uh, a suicide attempt a day and two suicides a month. Pretty serious. And uh, I called back after I was there six months later, and they said, well, we had one attempt each month and no suicides. So it dropped from one attempt a day and two a month to no suicides and just one attempt a month. And those were, la were related to alcohol abuse, the ones that they were. So that's pretty significant. Worked with the military, went to Fort Benning, worked with thousands of troops back uh, probably 2006, something like that. Uh, other church organizations, they call me out when they don't know what else to do. They, they say, there's, there's a problem, we don't know what to do. So they call me out. This is the organization that I created in 2006 uh, because most of the organizations are about awareness. I think we're all aware of suicide now after Robin Williams, right? <laughs> I don't think we need to be any more aware of it. We just need to know what to do about it. And at the end of this talk, you're going to know exactly what to do about it, believe it or not. Which, that's probably the most grateful thing I have to talk about at this uh, conference this year. So there's four topics I'm going to talk about. The two near-death experiences I had. I'm going to try to keep those short. I, I've made a Reader's Digest version of it, and I'm going to try to stick to that. The after effects... Uh, emotionally compromised and what that is and the four phase procedure that I've developed it it works from five years old to 95 may work on 115 and may work on a four-year-old I don't know I haven't tried it on them and how to enhance your after effects some people may not want to do that <laughs> to be clear on the emotionally compromised four-phase. Four-phase is a procedure that eliminates and or drastically reduces depression, anxiety, and or suicidal thoughts permanently, and all in under five minutes. Four-phase can be administered to others or can be self-administered by bypassing stigma. I developed four-phase over the past three decades and will demonstrate how it works during this lecture. This is the first time four phase has been made public. This is uh, in 2003, I authored My Last Breath, a first hand account of my two near death experiences. A digital copy of the original book is available back around the corner at the first table. There's also a donation bucket there for our organization. I don't like asking for donations because I'm a giver. I, I don't like, it kind of goes against my, my skin to do that, but I'm doing it anyways. Because we, we need the money to uh, propagate this solution. And that money goes to print these uh, booklets. Uh, we're raising money through Google. Uh, there's, a, there's a program, uh, actually an app that they developed for us that's raising money to send one of these booklets to each vet an active duty military guy. So they cost a buck a piece, and that's what we're doing with that money. Because uh, they have a problem with suicide. I don't know if you've heard about it. This book was, uh, I think, divinely inspired too, because I didn't want to write it. And, you know, God talks to me sometimes, and he, he started yelling at me, You write this book. And I said, No. And I said, Finally, I said, Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll write the book if a, I write a publisher and they say they'll publish it. And he, and he said, okay. So I, I, wrote a book, I wrote a publisher and said, I wrote this book about this thing. And they said, yeah, send us a manuscript. I'm like, oh. So then I had to write the book. I, you know, I had to do it within a month period, too. So I really had to rush through this. So I, I'm, go I'm going to be covering some things that are actually not in the book. And I, I did a, uh, a, a visual on this, too, so that you, it's a little more accurate. Because I, I think the pictures I, I got are actually more accurate than my... Uh, audio and visual description I, I put in the book. Uh, at, at the age of 12, I, I had no religious affiliation. I, I, didn't, I didn't have like a church up, upbringing where I was at a church or anything. We were just a normal 
a uh, middle class family. Uh, and while at a friend's house, uh, swimming beyond my means, I found myself at the bottom of the pool, face down, out of energy, air, and scared past terror, and extremely panicked as I knew I was about to take a breath of water deep into my lungs. I was down eight feet at the bottom of a deep end kidney-shaped pool. So the, it was a round bottom pool. There was nowhere to grab onto. And this was the second time I had been pushed down there by friends, so I was out of energy, out of air, and, and beyond my means to swim to the surface. Uh, I, I, I just knew this was going to be it for me because I was going to have to breathe in the water. Instantly, the, the second I turned in the water into my lungs, I was turned around face up, engulfed in a brilliant white light. And all my tear, terror and fear, fear <laughs> was replaced with peace and complete calm. I went through a brief life review. I was only 12, so it wasn't that big of a, a life review. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I had wonderful moments from my past that was... Uh, in ultra high, which I, I wrote that before I realized now they do have ultra high TV, so it's ultra, ultra high. So it's better than the ultra TV coming out. I could see everything clearly and felt completely loved. From the life review, I went into a white light at an incredible speed, shooting across the universe, seeing stars zip, by, zip past me, like, uh, you know, at a, at a speed that's pretty much incomprehensible, incomprehensible. The white light was streaming particles that seemed to be added to my soul, something that was needed or missing. As my attention was drawn back to the light, I could see silhouettes of 12 individuals standing shoulder to shoulder, blocking my progression. And then out up from the middle, another came. He drew closer, I knew who he was, Somehow I had always known who he was. The moment was like being very close to lightning as it hits the ground with that thunderous roar and earth shaking but without any sound. He was the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. It was Jesus Christ in a white robe, long hair, and piercing blue eyes. He came closer. I looked upon him in awe, unable to look away, nor wanting to. Without speaking verbally, he said, you have to go back. You have work to do. Simultaneously, he grabbed my wrist in a way you'd grab a snake as to not let me get away. As I was uttering the words, no, Water was coming out of my mouth. I, I was immediately on the side of the pool, back in my body, on my back, on the edge of the pool, with the bright sunlight assaulting my senses. All the other kids were standing over me or kneeling with terror and shock on their faces. A rage filled me with that I had never known before, along with embarrassment, and I pulled myself together long enough to catch a breath and run home. I found things were very different after that experience. My perception of reality had changed and I became emancipated. And then there were the after effects. The big one for me was empathy, or I was an empathic after this. This was very disturbing for a 12 year old as I was able to uh, feel the emotional states of others. And not only feel it, I could see it. It was like a, a cloud or like a tumbleweed around the people. Some were big, some were small, people were driving. I could still see this, but I, I, I kind of don't even pay attention to it anymore. But this was uh, disturbing when you're in a classroom and somebody's disturbed up front with feelings you really don't want to feel. And, you know, so I'm, I'm like not even want to be in the class anymore at this point. Uh, telepathy. Uh, 
being able to uh, read the minds of others, that, that kind of goes along with the empathic, because when you feel what's going on with people, you kind of know what's going on with them. Uh, clara, audi clara audience, that's where um, you're able to hear sounds, God talking to you. Other people talking to you don't want to hear either. <laughs> and uh, that this stuff I never talked about before either because I don't want to be a, an experiment. I don't want to be uh, put into a... Back, you got to realize this happened in the 70s. They, they had mental health institutions here in California. And there were a lot of people that saw Jesus there. I didn't want to go there. So uh, I just, I learned quickly to keep my mouth shut about this stuff. Uh, but if, other pe if it helps other people know, then, then I'll talk about it. Uh, knowing stuff's going to happen before it happens. I, I drive my wife nuts because I'm always calling her as she's picking the phone up to call me. <laughs> Friends, too. You know, I, you know I, they, they, free, they freak out. I sent a friend an email just yesterday, and he goes, uh, I was in the middle of sending you the exact same message. So uh, this is a a daily occurrence, this, this type of uh, side effect or after effect. I call them side effects, but IANS calls them after effects. So I want to make sure everybody knows if I say after effect or, or uh, side effect, you know what I'm talking about. Precog, uh, we are talking about that one. Remote viewing, now this one, I'm going to talk about because a movie just came out this weekend that uh, they're trying to explain uh, what happens in NDEs. And remote viewing explains what they're doing. <laughs> so I'm explaining what they're doing. They're trying to explain what we're doing. NDE is totally separate from uh, remote viewing. Remote viewing, you're in control. You go to a different time and place. And it, it's your, your choice. An NDE, you're out of control. You're just going where whatever's taking you, and you're experiencing it. That's totally different. Um, animals, animals drive me crazy. They want to be close to me. I think that's, uh, I think that's some of the uh, residue from heaven. They kind of are, are uh, they just see their maker or whatever. I just think they're they're drawn to you for that reason, but the, if you're an ND and the animals, people go that animal doesn't like anybody. It comes and jumps upon your lap, and you say, well, I, I know why that is. Uh, time pieces. This this was the first time I learned about this was at the uh, universe Northern University of uh, Texas, where we were doing that study, and they said most NDers can't wear time watches, or uh, you know watches or clocks or anything mechanical. I don't. I try not to keep my phone on me because it drains really quickly. Things like that. Batteries go dead. That's that's a, that's a after effect. Uh, not too many people know about that. If you do know about it, you just don't talk about it because you're just used to it. Children, same thing. Kids want to be around you, and I'm just like, you know, I don't want to be mean. Just like, hey, okay, I see you. Same with animals too. They just want to be seen. Just say. I see you, nice to see you, go away, you know, that, that thing. I, I like animals, by the way, I got a dog, very high maintenance. Okay. By the time I was 25, I found that alcohol and drugs suppressed the after effects, but the dysfunctionality of abuse made my life unbearable. And a little voice said to me, why don't you kill yourself? And I don't, I don't know who that one was, but I think you get a good idea who that was. And a relief came over me, like a solution to my problems had come to me. And I drove to a place called Potter Flats in an Anchorage, outside of Anchorage, Alaska. It's a bird sanctuary and a very peaceful place, very beautiful. That's actually the road that goes next to it. The Potter's Flats is the area to the left of that. And then there's the ocean to the right. And it was a Friday afternoon. Unlike this picture, it was blue skies, horizon to horizon. 
beautiful May, end of May, spring day, uh, just gorgeous, like in the 80s. And this is a view looking off the road into Potter's Flats. And it's only about three feet deep at its deepest point, which I'll tell you how I know that. But uh, that's what it looks like. You, you pull off to a side area and you look at the Potter's Flats. And uh, I parked in a turnout and I proceeded to take three bottles of sleeping pills and a fifth of gin. This, this stuff's not fun for me to talk about. <laughs> not public or privately. I don't like to talk about it, but if it helps somebody, I'll talk about it. As I got sleepier, I started to drowse, get drowsy, and I experienced a flash of light. Now this light, the only thing I can describe this light would be, um, we're recording everything constantly. Sights, sounds, touch, smell, everything. Imagine it's a uh, camcorder and you turn the button off and you're watching uh, a replay of your family vacation. You know the big gaps that happen? Well, when the flash of lights happen, there's a huge gap. But not only is the visual different and you don't know where you're at, but there's a thought going on at the same time you come back and you're in mid-thought and you're going, it's very strange, but basically the recording system shut off and came back on. And when it came back on, there was a huge gap. I was suddenly in mid-thought per perplexed at what I was looking at. The sky was cloudy, violently boiling cloud mass, and I was struggling to keep my balance. When I looked down, I saw why. I was standing up to my waist in water, and my feet were in mud up to my ankles. Somehow I had gotten into the middle of the bird sanctuary. Everything was gray, and I could couldn't hear past a couple of inches. So if you put your hands up to your ears, that's what it sounded like. I could see the, when I turned around, I could see the road, but I was a few hundred yards away from the road. And I tried to see where the footprints were to how I got out there so I could retrace my steps, and there were none. I finally got myself turned around, unstuck out of the mud, and I started to make my way back to my car, which I could see on the road. But there was somebody in my driver's seat. I was about a few hundred yards away from the car at the time, so I couldn't make out who it was, but I was still trying to figure out why I would choose to walk out into the middle of the bird sanctuary, and why the sky was now cloudy. started to make some progress when, again, I had a flash of light and the camcorder shut off. Again, a gap in my recording process had me in mid-thought, wondering why my legs were not moving correctly, and I was looking down at my feet that were now on asphalt. And my pants were wet, and I'm trying to figure out why this was. When I looked up from the ground, I could see I was walking alongside a highway but there were no cars, and a light fog covered both directions. So this highway here looked like this. My legs were not moving correctly. Like my brain would say, move left leg, and it would take a couple seconds to move. So I was walking kind of like Frankenstein. I could tell I was on the highway, but I couldn't understand why there were no cars, because this was a Friday afternoon, and it was a beautiful day, and if anybody knows about Seward, that's where everybody goes salmon fishing, so it's a non-stop stream of vehicles going both ways. And there were no cars. And then suddenly I remembered that I'd been trying to kill myself, and, and uh, 
I still was trying to figure out why I'd walked out into the bird sanctuary at this point. But looking back on it, I know I was not in this dimension any longer. Just then, as I was trying to figure out why my legs were still not working correctly, a car pulled up next to me. And this is verifiable. I wrote this in the book in 2000. And two is when I wrote it, but in 2003 it was published. This, this car is very similar to that car. It was a New York style cab. It was old, rusty, dirty, and the markings were unreadable. I'd never seen a cab like this in Alaska. The passenger window was down and a greasy haired, sweaty, bloated man was at the wheel with crazy eyes. And it'd be crazy eyes. One's looking down the road and one's looking at me. And the driver asked in a very scruffy voice, need a ride? I said nothing, and he just sat there as if he knew I'd get in. I was, I was so tired that I figured I'd get in just for a moment and, and be able to close my eyes and get some rest. I just needed a minute or two to rest. The inside was as bad as the outside. The windows were so dirty that I couldn't see out or, or between us, the divider, the glass divider. But as he took off, uh, I put my head back and closed my eyes and had another flash of light. Now, this, this, is, the, uh, this is the freaky part. This movie... Perry Jackson's Sea of Monsters came out in 2013. I, we rented it a couple months ago and we're watching it and this part came on. This taxi cab came out of nowhere, pulled up and they, I quote this out of the movie, it says, it's a chariot of the damnation, of damnation. And, they, and the other character goes, it looks like a New York City cab. And the other character goes, same thing. So I, I, I like re the movie like four times. I'm all freaked out. I was like, that was exactly the same thing. I, so I started looking, researching about this. And the Chariot of Damnation is a uh, my mythology, uh, a soul collector. And uh, basically, they, they've a soul that's lived in hell for 500 years that really wasn't that bad, they put them into work on earth collecting souls of the damned. And there was a similar show that came on that I saw that was an old Twilight Zone where a driver was driving a semi-truck and he was picking up the souls of the damned and but he was uh, releasing them, some of them. He'd check out, see who was good and bad and he'd release the ones that were Weren't, weren't that bad or hadn't done anything that would be worthy of hell. But, uh, I mean, this literally freaked me out for like a week that somebody's, uh, somebody else obviously has seen the same thing. So, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of reassuring to me, but it still freaks me out. So if you die and a cab pulls up next to you, it looks like that, don't get in. <laughs> I don't care how tired you are. <laughs> Uh, the flash of light happened again, and uh, this time I was uh, basically, uh, uh, I was in mid-free fall. Went from the cab to mid-free fall into a pit. I was screaming, terrified, knowing that when I hit the bottom, I was going to be killed. Which is kind of ironic because that's what I wanted in the first place, but the terror was uh, indescribable. And I free fell for some time before coming to uh, the top of a cavern when I came out of the bottom of that pit. The blackness was blacker than anything I'd ever seen, but I still was aware that there were walls to this pit. When I came out of the hole, basically, into the top of a vast cavern, there were no walls in sight. It was dark, gray, and it had been gray since 
the first flash of light. There, there have been no color since then. It was a vast, vast cavern. A haze was about the ground. Fall, flailing my arms and legs in terror, I screamed as I descended from a height of about the height of clouds, about 10,000 feet, you could say. At that precise moment, my soul was split into seven souls, comprehending all seven simultaneously. The seven souls were dispatched across the area at great distances from each other. The ground was a clayish material like you'd find in a clay uh, tennis court. Uh, there was no color, black. Uh, there was flashes of lightning across the sky. It was a, a boiling cloud mass. I could hear thunder in the distance again. I couldn't hear very far. It was a heavy, dense place. Uh, there were, this was like, if you can imagine, the ground, and then there's like 12, 10 feet of steam coming up, and that was like walls, and then looking up at the sky. I, I looked at the sky constantly because I knew that was the only way out. Um, there was nothing good in this place, and and nothing alive, or what I would consider alive. Individuals would come out from within the steam and attack my six souls from within the steam walls. Creatures emerged in the form of those I'd met throughout my life, expressions frozen on their faces of emotional pain I had caused them. As they came close to me, they would push, scream, shove, yell profanities, and their touches triggered memories of emotional pain I had caused each person as, the, as I saw through their perspective. Two of the souls were experiencing my past from birth. Two were experiencing ex events that were from my current experience where I had killed myself, and two were from future experiences, my uh, effects on other people throughout time and the pain I had caused them. Uh, I won't get into details because I don't want to start crying and I don't have time. So uh, the last of the seven was the most disturbing, where I was, I was on my hands and knees and on my face weeping for Jesus to get me out of here. I spent the most time on the hell thing because most people want to hear about that for some reason because not too many people want to talk about that. <laughs> I wonder why. But they do share with me. Sometimes people come to me and say, you know what? Uh, I've had that happen. I go, well, you want to tell me more? And they go, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on the third day, all, all of me was drawn up into one where I was praying, weeping, and something grabbed me by the back of the neck like you'd grab a puppy dog and started lifting me out of this place and utterly defeated, beaten, done. Uh, a voice told me that you still have work to do. I knew who that was. And I was shown a vision of hell for eternity for me, which is indescribable and incomprehensible for words. I saw a movie, uh, Constantine. That movie, very clear depiction. Somebody's obviously been to where I've been because the, with, minus the guy standing there, that's everything. Nothing's good. Everything's destroyed. There's nothing good there. That's, that's, and then his, you know, a few minutes in hell is enough. And I spent three days there. I, I believed it was, there was a progression of day and night. No, no sunlight, but there was darkness, day, dark, night. And when I came to, I thought it was three days later. I came to, I, was, uh, I felt myself go through the blackness up into my body. And somebody was screaming at me. My roommate was screaming at me because they had spent the night looking for me. I'm 12 miles away from where I started. I, was, I wasn't even able to stand up, much less drive at this point. So I don't even know how I got there. Nobody knows how I got there. All I know is that uh, this place wasn't of earth. And, and uh, so I, 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 um, 
I had another uh, experience with after effects after this. And uh, it was the f I, I thought the house was on fire. I saw steam coming out of the walls. And uh, I got seven firemen standing there. And I'm telling them, don't you see the smoke coming out of the walls? And they're like, no. And that's when I started saying, oh, I better keep my thoughts to myself, you know, because uh, I'm going to find myself in a, a rubber room if I keep talking. Started seeing little creatures trying to chew through the, through the floor, trying to get me back. I mean, very scary stuff. I made it through it, though. Happy to be here. So after effects of an NDE, these are the ones I talked about earlier, but I've had them since uh, childhood. These are uh, why a lot of people have problems that have had NDEs. The, the stigma, they're perceived as being special, different, and people don't know how to uh, handle you. Uh, like I said, now I wanted to become an experiment or, or be fixed. I don't need to be fixed. I, I'm fine just the way I am. Not understanding why these we have these things. Th this is probably the longest process anyone will have as an NDE year to find out what this gift will do to help other people. First of all, you got to realize it's to help other people. <laughs> Uh, hard to adjust to the change in your perception. That's the most difficult. But I do encourage you to join IANS. And if you go to IANS.org, uh, become a member, share your stories with others, it'll help you. If you're struggling with your NDE or these experiences, it's good to have other people who've had the same thing and you don't feel so alone and you don't feel like you're so traumatized. Emotionally compromised. I like when they said that. You're emotionally compromised. You no longer can be captain. <laughs> Happiness versus happy. Most people get confused about these two things. Happy is the result of an experience. I went to the ice cream store, had a big cup of ice cream. That makes me happy. Happiness is a choice. It's a lifestyle. But it's difficult to be ha have a happiness in your life when you're having a trauma that keeps being brought up in your brain. So now we're going to talk about phase four. Luckily, it's a very short procedure. So phase four is a procedure I developed for those that suffer from depression, anxiety, and or suicidal thoughts. Depressive disorders are a stigma health or a significant health issue affecting one in five people in the world. That's significant. And this is by WHO, World Health Organization. 350 million people suffer from depression each day. That's significant. But I've cracked the code for depression, and I'm going to explain that today. Some people would take this knowledge and try to sell you a seminar. I don't get any money from the seminar either, so I just said so we're clear on that. And this is going to be free. It's going to go on, be my legacy to everybody else. And emotionally compromised. Uh, Post-traumatic stress do disorder, known, uh, commonly known as PTSD, Anytime we experience a situation and or circumstance that falls outside an individual's usual scope of life experiences. This is like uh, you watch somebody get murdered. Uh, you get neglected, murdered, raped, all these things. I put in here examples, but it could be something just minor, but it, it's outside of your scope of usual life experiences. And the ears have the dubious honor of having the highest level of a trauma a person can experience because NDE is, is way off the edge of the map, way off the edge of the map. And it's very difficult. That's why I encourage people to become members of the uh, IANS uh, organization. Okay, so if you look at a map of your memories in your brain, they look like the universe. Some stars are bright. That could be your first kiss. One could be when you were molested. The other ones are just life skills, fun moments, a movie, something like that. 
What determines the brightness of a memory is the state of emotion you were in at the time of that experience. Very important for you to understand that. Because your emotional state and your memories are two separate things. We, we, I put five senses up here. We have something like 21 senses, actually. But these are the main ones. Feel, see, hear, taste, smell. The emotion's in the center. The bigger the emotion, the bigger the star. Now, this is important to know because the intensity of a memory, our ability to recall events, is determined by how much we feel at the time of the experience. The two root emotions, there's only two, love and fear. Two, two emotions, love and fear. Everything's traced back to those two things. All the emotions. The difference between emotions and sensory memories is that sensory memories are constantly changing. Emotions, we have a limited range of emotions. They're, they're static, but we attach them to a sensory experience. So they're not permanent. These are the components of a memory right here. We have all the sensory data, and then we have our emotional states, and there's a bond between them. We get rid of that bond, no matter what the memory is, that memory becomes a past distant memory that you're apathetic to. In return, what happens is it changes your perception of reality, this reality. And it takes about 24 hours after this procedure to have that completely take effect. And this is where four phase comes in. Because we, we're gonna be going from hard data to the subconscious, four times. When you do that and you're focused on one memory, it's gonna delete that memory. So my issue is that I've been doing this on hundreds, probably over a thousand people. <laughs> they come to me in the worst possible state. They're, they're done. They wanna get out of here. They wanna jump off the building, but they give me one chance. Okay, I'm gonna give you a chance. I'll do anything to not feel this way. The problem is when I do this procedure on them, they literally have no memory of ever feeling that way, ever. So they don't, have the, they don't feel the need to donate to our organization after that. <laughs> they don't even contact me. I have to call them. Are you still alive? Yeah, okay. So what I did was I put together this preface that you have to test the validity of this procedure. And the way you do that is if you have a trauma, this could be something that happened. Oh yeah, if, if you're depressed, this is important. If you're depressed, most people will say, oh, that's too bad. What's going on? I, I say, okay, what's going on? They tell me, oh, my dog died, my wife left, I just went bankrupt, I'm, I'm depressed. Okay, well, how, I ask, how long have you been depressed? And they say, well, I've been depressed like 10 years, 20 years, since yesterday, whatever. I, okay, what happened 10 years ago? Oh, well, my mother died. Okay, that's the thing I wanna work on, not the depression today, because depression is a side effect. It's a side effect. It's a result of something that happened years ago or yesterday, or it could happen in the parking lot. Somebody stole your spot, but it doesn't matter. But we can get rid of, we have to work on the issue, not the side effect. So I ask people, if you have something you wanna work on, what is it? I don't need a paragraph, I just need you to know you know what it is. Put it down, say, uh, when I was 10, boom, you know what happened. I don't need to know, I really don't wanna know. Just as long as you know. How long have you felt this way? Uh, days, weeks, as long as you know, and then you say it's 10 days, is that when it first started? No. Okay, when did it first start? Well, when I was six, what happened then? Okay, so if you know what's going on, that's good. So at this point, we start this 
preface. I want you to write down what it is that happened, the level of intensity that you feel about this. It's very important because you're not going to remember this. If it's a 10, 10 is I want to kill myself after I leave this meeting. That's a 10. Uh, 8, I'm just depressed. I don't want to live like this anymore. That's 8. What would, you, what would you pay to have this fixed today? I don't even want to know that either. I just want you to know what it's worth to you value-wise. And then put down a week from today a date that you're going to look at this. I also need to know, there's one thing I left out of here, frequency. How often do you reoccur this thought? He did that to me. They did this to me. I did this to them. Guilt's a big one. There's probably somebody in here who feels guilty for doing something to somebody. This is a good one too. If you feel guilty about doing something to somebody, this is work for that too. So one week from now, you're going to say, what, what do I think about that situation? What was the frequency I thought about that situation over the past week? And would you consider making a donation afterwards to prove that this works and to help other people? So we're going to get into four phase now. Now, I made these cards out. I didn't put them back there because I want to make sure you know how to use them. This is, this is four phase right here. It's on this card, believe it or not. So you can do this yourself. You can do it in the bathroom, whatever. But anyways, it says emotionally compromised. It has a whole bunch of emotions on here. Emotionally compromised is you're like, you're jacked up mentally. It's, it's, it's hard for you to focus on what you want to get done. You want to know what your, your issues are. You want to know what your traumas are. Stand in front of the mirror naked in the morning and you'll hear them. I am, I am. You'll start hearing them. And who told you that? Who told you that? How would you like to get rid of that? Those are your limitations. This is very simple. If I can do this for a five-year-old, I can do it for you guys. What we're going to be doing is you're going to be closing your eyes, and you're going to be remembering the event that this caused you so much problems over the years or days or however long it's caused you a problem. And you focus on one event, one event that, that you just want to forget about. The, the thing is, though, this is, a, this is about forgiveness. Either you have to forgive somebody or yourself. And if you're not ready to do that, you're not ready to do this. I've actually had people say, no, I don't want to do this, once they realize what they have to do. Because <laughs> some people just don't want to forgive. It's their identity. So what we're going to do is you close your eyes, and Einstein says, imagination is more important than knowledge. And because knowledge is very limited, imagination has no boundaries. And I'm going to prove that right now for anybody who's doing this procedure. You close your eyes, you look at the, the event that took place, and you change something you saw in that event. Either you change the person to a different character, you can put a rabbit head on somebody, and you have them go through the whole event or yourself, and then you start over again, you change the voice, the sounds, some sound in the situation, you change it, you play music in the background, something different than what was there. Three, you do it again, and this time you change what you felt. You can make the guy laughing, telling jokes, or a girl, or whatever, yourself. You can make the temperature hotter or colder, you can make it raining, or you can make it sunny, depending upon what it was, you change what it was. And number four, you change the speed in which it happened. You can change it fast or slow, or put it in reverse, play it backwards like a Benny Hill show. And that's it. Basically, you're changing your perspective of that event. Once you've changed the recording, 
It detaches the emotion that took place at that experience. Now you're, you're going to, you, if you do this correctly, you're going to feel your frontal lobe tingle a little bit, just in front of your ears, almost by your temples. This is where your decision-making process is, right here. Your me emotional memories are back here. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, after my uh, near-death experience where I went to uh, heaven, I came back and I have this spot right here, a white spot. My hair has turned white. Right there is where your imagination memory uh, is used right there which I didn't know until like a week ago, so I thought that was funny. But our imagination taps into the great unknown. Without imagination, we wouldn't be flying. We wouldn't have microwaves. We wouldn't have cell phones. It's amazing. We're tapping into something that's greater than ourselves. And it's, it's, this part of our brain is actually a uh, transmitter receiver. We can you can tap into amazing things. That's, that's four phase. It's very simple. I have this little card here. I'm going to put them back in the back. Anybody can have them. They're very, they're very uh, useful. I'm going to be uh, putting this on, uh, actually, iBooks pretty soon so that anybody can do it. And, and uh, I'll be doing a video like this with it. Now, some people won't want to do this, but this is how to enhance your after effects. If you want to learn more about the uh, the four phase, you can contact me. Be happy to talk to you about it. I have I can do this over the phone too. It's very effective over the phones, especially with suicide. People call me. Very effective. Uh, it helps to tell people I tried to kill myself too, because then they can they relax and they say, "Oh yeah, I, I've tried or whatever." And then I say, "I got this procedure. Are you willing to do it?" And they say, "Yes or no." And then if they're not willing to do it, oh, that's the big one, too. If, if you cannot do this procedure, you're not willing to look at a past trauma, then you need to see uh, another level, which is uh, psychiatry or therapist or something like that, because uh, you, you basically have built a wall around the trauma, uh, self-preservation, and you need somebody to help you get through that wall to, to uh, continue on with life. And I'm about quality of life. Because I think we sh we're here to help each other get through this thing, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. I just know that I'm here to help. And like in Constantine, I'm a suicide. So I don't, I I'm very guided. <laughs> very guided. So anybody that comes up to me and says, I need help, I help them. Because uh, I don't like the consequences. I know what the consequences are. At least for me. This is very short, so I'm going to go on with this. Uh, avoid putting these things in your mouth. GMOs, pesticides, or I, I'm not saying drink pesticides. I'm saying if it's on food, don't eat it. If it says it's not on, if it doesn't say it's not on it, it's on it. Herbicides, antibiotics, growth hormones, antibacterial. Uh, did you know they, they dip chickens in an antibacterial solution? Even the organic one, so if it doesn't say that it's not have any solution added, it's got an antibacterial solution on it, which causes skin rash. I hate to say this, but our dog is our test subject. And we give her food, and if she has an outbreak or something, we go, we're not eating that. I mean, she's still alive, she's good. But, <laughs> but we don't feed her GMOs or anything like that. I mean, we just test the stuff they say is good. And we're like, oh, that's not good. Flavor enhancers. Flavor enhancers, there's, flavor enhancers are designed to tap into, uh, we're driven by two things, two things. Uh, we seek pleasure and avoid pain. That's it. Nothing else. So if we have to eat every day. So they put flavor enhancers that are like high def into food. And it, and it triggers our craving. And then what happens is that when we're eating, we say, I want to feel good. And I want to feel good about what I'm eating. So you go, I want that donut. So you eat the donut, and it, 
there's no nutritional value in that donut, but you crave it anyways. And that's flavor enhancers, and that could be sugars, uh, preservatives, anything like that that's, that's uh, unnatural. It's unnatural. What we should be eating is only organics, USDA a certified. Um, I mean, that's the best we can do. Wild caught fish. That does, you have to look at fish now to see which ones absorb uh, heavy metals like mercury. Organic chicken that has no added water or chicken broth. Organic coffee and tea. This, this one I just found out about a few months ago. I, I was like, oh my God, I've been just, I drink coffee and then I found out about this. Like a, a field, a, an acre of lettuce has like two and a half pounds of pesticides on it. An acre of coffee, first of all, if it doesn't say it's organic, it's gmo They put 250 pounds of pesticides on an acre of coffee. And I'm just like, oh my God. So now we have, we switched all our coffee out and we're drinking, it, it actually tastes better. And I don't have that little uh, uh, oil slick in my coffee now. And I realize what that was now. I had really purified pesticides there for a while. Uh, organic co uh, chicken, okay, coffee, tea, tea, same thing. I don't want to name any uh, brand name coffees, but I went to their store and said, do you have any organic coffee? No. So you want to ask. They're big though. They have a little lady on the cup. I don't want to get in trouble for saying that. Structured water. I drink structured water. This was a uh, study done in in uh, Japan by uh, Dr. Masura Umoto, and uh, he realized he found out that if you put something on water, it changes the molecular structure of that water. And uh, you might want to look at that. It's a movie. There's a movie he was in. Uh, what the heck do we know, anyways? But uh, I drink structured water, and it's, uh, it, it's amazing. You put dirty water in there, and it goes clean. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, I, I recommend, this is the end, so I recommend that you pick up an instrument. Nothing stimulates the mind more than playing an instrument. The studies have shown the brain activity. This is great for if you're a, a senior. Pick up a gazoo, something that you can play. Learn a tune, and it will stimulate every area of your brain. This is something that I recommend as well. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank the INs for having me as a guest speaker at this 2014 annual conference. If you have any questions, you can talk to me afterwards or contact me through supportisp.org, which is a 501c3 public charity and mylastbreath.com, which is the book. And for a limited time, you can buy the digital copy of the old copy book for $4.99 on the website as well. In closing, I'm gonna say this, after you've deleted your uh, traumas out of your brain, uh, Smile Therapy was created in Berkeley, Northern California. They took uh, manic depressants and they put them in a room and they said, we're gonna give you the Smile Therapy. All they had to do for like five times a day for 10 minutes was smile. They did this for a year. And by the end of the year, they were declared not manic depressants anymore. Just by doing that, which is amazing to me. But I encourage everybody to smile. Smile therapy works. Uh, it's actually difficult to do, especially in a crowd when people are not smiling. So thank you. And if you have any questions, talk to me afterwards.